Our first film is Congo, and for a thriller, it's pretty funny. But how much of the humor is intended is open to question. Maybe laughable is a better word. Maybe howlingly silly is better still. Congo follows an assortment of characters into the heart of the Congo. A scientist wants to return a homesick gorilla. He's trying to use sign language and drink martinis. I wish the film company that had made Congo would have had the courage or maybe the stupidity to have released to us scenes of the talking gorilla with her schoolgirl voice that's so inappropriate. I wish you also could have seen the first shots of the talking gorilla where the head covering an actor is plainly visible. More problems? Tim Curry's character is a nut, Ernie Hudson's is a lightweight as their guide, and Joe Don Baker, a buffoon, is a villain. In short, Congo is a mess. I'd like to say it's so bad it's good, but... In its concluding act, it was simply boring. I disagree. I agree with what you observe. I disagree with your interpretation. First of all, Ernie Hudson was fabulous as the guide. He reminded me of uh, Clark Gable in the way that he what? handled this role, the way that he balanced humor with kind of a Clark bemused detachment. Gable? Now you talk about. I thought I you talk heard about it all. The, Let's keep going. You talk about the gorilla's bad voice that you didn't like, Gene. Yeah. I think you missed the point. She uses American Sign Language in order yes. to activate a speech synthesizer. I know that's correct. And it's supposed to be funny. It was hilarious. I laughed at it, not with it. This has some goofy funniness to uh, it. I think if people go with the right sh uh, state of mind, they're going to have a trip. Yeah, have a couple Movie of martinis. Stars Michael Boatman is the rookie who watches uneasily as a veteran white officer, played by Don Harvey, pulls over a man whose only crime is being black. He's played by Ice Cube. You mind if I search the car? Not unless you got a warrant. What do you got in the car, Teddy? I know my right. Hey, man, if I arrest you, that car is mine. The young man is framed for murder by two corrupt detectives in the department, played by veteran movie bad guys M. Emmett Walsh and Michael Ironside. I didn't kill nobody. I didn't rob nobody. I never even used a gun. All the state wants is to close the books. The state doesn't care if you get seven years or life. Bowman's only confidant on the force is the rookie female officer, played by Lori Petty. The uh, serial number on the gun I picked up with Teddy Woods has been changed on my arrest report. Why would somebody do that? Because Teddy Woods is a perfect suspect. The Glass Shield is a movie with good performances, good ideas, and a lot of good scenes, but unfortunately, the screenplay is very weak. It doesn't organize the material or build toward much of a point. It meanders, it gets distracted, and it doesn't really pay off at the end. Because the basic material here is so promising, it's a shame that director Charles Burnett didn't shape this material more clearly. There's a good movie here somewhere, but The Glass Shield doesn't find it. I found it in the picture. I thought what was so uh, interesting and compelling about the picture mm -hmm. is that Burnett doesn't use violence, which you would expect in a mm -hmm. police thriller. It's one of the few police films that we've seen that doesn't have lots of gunplay in it. And it takes its energy from looks, by, in a very stylized direction, looks by the characters in their conspiracy, mm -hmm. and... Uh, and intimida psychological intimidation. It also has to. De it also deals um, with self-image of this young man, mm -hmm. and I, I thought that was very powerful. I, I thought this was a f really original piece of work in a genre that is very tired. Well, Burnett is a very interesting director. He made *To Sleep with Anger*, for example. Yeah. Uh, the problem here, I think, is that the screenplay just doesn't get it organized. For example, there's a big trial, and then uh, there's a mistrial. They haven't arrived at anything, and then there's. There's another thing that happens. And Roger, you keep... the story is on this young man. It's all on his well, face. And, and the another problem is him. that characters keep appearing out of nowhere in order to solve problems by telling us things we didn't know before and we didn't know the characters uh, uh, existed before either. And there were other scenes that don't seem to connect with anything before or after them. Uh, they connected for me because the unifying theme is the pressure that this guy is under. He tries to do the right thing to get along and then uh, ends up paying for it. Okay, coming up next, the latest Disney animated feature, Pocahontas. It's how we say hello. Can't leave you. You never will. No matter what happens to me, I'll always be with you. Forever. An Indian maid named Pocahontas must chart her own romantic future as her tribe deals with a threat to its future in Pocahontas, the magnificently drawn new Disney animated feature that is surprisingly powerful in its condemnation of those who destroyed the American landscape as well as its native citizens. In fact, that element of the movie is what recommends it much more than its love story. The time, of course, is 1607, and Powhatan Indian Pocahontas yearns, like all recent Disney heroines, to decide on her own 
whom she will marry. At this historical time, marriage is her career. Pocahontas' speaking voice is by Irene Bedard. Mary Kokum? I told him it would make my heart sore. But he's so serious. Now look at the drawing in this scene as Pocahontas, sung by Judy Kuhn, begins to explore what direction her life will take. What I dreamed the day might send just around the river bend for me, coming for me. Enter English sea captain John Smith, spoken and sung by Mel Gibson. Here he dreams of exploring and conquering America. But the bad guy of the story is the Virginia Company's governor, John Ratcliffe, spoken and sung by David Ogden Stiers. He simply wants to loot the land, and this is where the film is at its most powerful as the British destroy the landscape. This land we behold, a man can be and all can be sold. Another high point comes when Pocahontas sings of her Indian traditions to John Smith. The song is called Colors of the Wind. Again, beautifully drawn. I think the only people who are people are the people who look and think like you. But if you walk the footsteps of a stranger, you'll learn things you never knew, you never knew. If there's a singular image in Pocahontas, for me, it's not Pocahontas or John Smith. For me, it was the beautifully drawn tall trees that symbolize the purity and potential of the land we've inherited. I like the film a lot. I wish it went on longer. I guess I'll have to settle for seeing it again soon. I liked it, too, and I agree with you that the drawing in this film is particularly good. The realization of the American landscape yes. at that time and of the characters is really well done. And I like the film, but I must say, if I had to rank these last five Disney films, starting right. with The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, and Lion King, I would rank this fifth out of those five in quality. And I'll tell you why. It doesn't have a really fun villain. Uh, the Indians are the good guys. These settlers are not really allowed to be the bad guys. I mean, when there's one person who was killed, it's done by mistake by a young kid who feels bad about it. And the governor of the colony is a buffoon who isn't really taken seriously. And the others, well, except for John Smith, are shadow characters. So that you don't have the fun, for example, of the octopus uh, in Little Mermaid or uh, the beast in Beauty and the Beast. You don't have a really great, fun villain. And so the movie, as a result, is kind of serious and a little bit of a downer at times. What's wrong with that? I, Nothing you're, you're is wrong forcing, with it, Roger, but you're what forcing I'm talking this about is the entertainment value of the five. You're forcing this to be uh, like the other, kind, the other pictures, and this film wants to be a little bit, it is a more well, serious subject matter. Well, if you were going to rank the five, where would you place it? I wouldn't put it at the bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd probably put it uh, in the middle. My favorite is uh, Beauty and the Beast, and I have a real affection for Little Mermaid, but this is, mm -hmm. this is serious themes. This isn't about the, mm -hmm. the uh, uh, underwater fantasy characters. This is real stuff. It should be more serious. And I really think that the film communicates at a whole other level. The villain, the villain, well, I'm not, uh, the villain. I'm not are criticizing. They... I'm making an observation about the entertainment value of the movie, and I think it's valid. The entertainment value is in the drawing and in the great themes. I think it's a real special piece of work. When we come back, a strange movie about a man who returns to his old life, this time as a dog. Fluke is next. It's taken me years to build this route, and I'm not going to let some rookie ruin it for me. Now you just sit there and watch the master. A young dog named Fluke learns the ropes from an old dog with the voice of Samuel L. Jackson in Fluke, a strange movie that looks like a family picture about animals, but is actually a film that deals with some fairly deep and interesting questions. In the opening scenes, a man is killed in a car crash, and then we learn that he's been reincarnated inside the body of a puppy. Fluke's voice is by Matthew Modine, who also plays the man Fluke used to be. I lived in a house. I had a family. I had a life once, Rumbo. You got one now. A damn good one. I'm gonna find him. The more he remembers, the more Fluke feels the need to return to his former family, including his widow, played by Nancy Travis, and his son, Max Pomerantz. All right. Mm -hmm. 
for just one meal and then he's gone. Deal? Deal. Mm -hmm. Now, we might as well face it, a lot of the scenes in Fluke are appealing simply because this is a cute dog. But then the story itself is interesting, too, especially as we learn more about the events leading up to that fatal car crash. I was sort of surprised how absorbed I was by this movie, which, despite the cute dog, is not necessarily a children's film at all. In fact, it might be too intense for younger kids, but it's appropriate as a family picture. Well, I took a younger kid, and uh, it was uh, thought-provoking, mm -hmm. and I don't think it's too intense. I think uh, it, it'll be a good film to see with your kids. Uh, without giving away too much, the most provocative idea in the film comes at the very end of the story. And all I want to say about it is the notion that animals possess souls, mm -hmm. which is a healthy thing for people to believe, mm -hmm. is put out in a very poetic, beautiful way. Mm -hmm. And uh, that lingers long after the film is over. And I think it's a testament to the power of the picture, mm -hmm. uh, a really odd little film, uh, that tries to take seriously a children's fair. I mean, I think it's really, we've, we've had the same situation, a person put into the, into the body of a dog, played for comic effect. Yeah, unless he was talking. This one, like that, yeah. this one's done seriously. Yes, it is. And there were some really poignant scenes, for example, when the dog sits in the chair that used to be his, <laughs> when this was his office, and when he goes and looks through the window at his family, and then when he pushes a little toy soldier, and his son says, hey, my dad used to do that. There's real poignancy there. It just shows you artistic treatment. This is a serious filmmaker can make stuff like that work. Coming up next, Hollywood is under attack by a presidential hopeful, but just how good of a film critic is Senator Robert Dole? We'll vote on his recent comments about the movies next. Dole's attack on Hollywood, its movies and music, has earned front page coverage in newspapers and news magazines across the country. Dole is a candidate for president. He's trying to woo the religious right and the most conservative elements of the Republican Party, as well as parents everywhere. And he's offering up Hollywood as the boogeyman responsible for violence in society. Well, it's easy to dismiss Senator Dole, especially when under questioning, he revealed that he hadn't seen any of the movies he had knocked or any of the movies he had praised. Basically, he was just reading a speech a political strategist had written for him. And you can question his sanity or sincerity when he takes a hard position on movies for contributing to violence in America, but he's soft on gun control. And yet to knock the messenger is to risk ignoring the message. Of course, I wish executives and filmmakers had better taste. And the operative word there is, of course, <laughs> it's so obvious. But. Dole's speechwriter blasted Oliver Stone's natural born killers and praised the Flintstones. I think he got it backwards. Natural born killers was an over the top, sometimes brilliant, sometimes out of control tirade against the media and some members of the public who would make heroes out of criminals. If I was a mass murderer, I'd be Mickey and Mallory. I'm not being glib here, and I expect to defend it when I say I'm more troubled by the success of the Flintstones than by the excesses of natural-born killers. I'm disturbed at an audience that laps up the Flintstones and yet rejects such excellent family fare available now as a little princess. Whose taste is getting worse, Hollywood or the mass audience, or both? One thing bothered me was the obvious partisanship of his speech. If you were to name the three top people responsible for violence in movies today, as far as the box office is concerned, Oliver Stone wouldn't be anywhere on that list. The three top names would be Schwarzenegger, Stallone, and Bruce Willis. And what do those three names have in common? Conservative Republicans who donate a lot of money to the party. And so somehow, Dole doesn't mention those. In fact, he recommends the Schwarzenegger picture, True Lie, he says he that's likes it, even though he hadn't seen that either. Yet he says he doesn't like loveless sex in the movies. If he had seen True Lies, he would have seen a scene in which a woman strip teases for a man she doesn't know is her own husband. I bet he would have really considered that to be love in marriage. He doesn't seem to be willing to make the connection between real things that make a difference in our society yep. and the shadows of those things, which are the movies. He approves of guns in the streets, but he doesn't approve of guns on the screen. So it seems to me that by making this speech, based on movies he hasn't seen, hasn't thought about, he's basically revealing himself as somebody who only wants to cater to what he thinks is his constituency, doesn't want to make a serious contribution to the national debate. Two things. One, uh, this impulse, if you take it at its best, the impulse is, 
I can't control the real world, so I'm going to control the fantasy I'm world. I'm going to blame the messenger. But I'm going to control, mm -hmm. try to control this movie theater. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that I don't want us to get turned around in the public's mind and saying, well, they really like those bad movies. Not true. No. We dump on them every single week. We mm -hmm. want the movies mm -hmm. to be better. It's a legitimate thing. And if this helps, mm -hmm. if this helps, then I'd be very surprised. You if and it does. I both, it'd I, be great. Both, I think, had some negative things to say about both True Lies and The Specialist, although I thought True Lies was very uh, entertaining. And, and the latest Bruce Willis uh, bomb picture, I think, is just junk. There I think it's just are. explosions for the eyes. Well, I enjoy the explosions for the eyes. So, you see, we're having a real debate about movies that we've seen and thought about, and that's something Senator Dole hasn't contributed to. When we come back, our video pick of the week, a tribute to the British filmmakers who call themselves The Archers. Week, brought to you by Orville Redenbacher, the first and last name in popcorn. Now it's time for our weekly video segment, and this week I'd like to talk about the current national tribute to British director Michael Powell and his longtime screenwriter, Emmerich Pressburger. Together they called themselves The Archers, and they made an astonishing string of films from the 30s until the 60s that still seem breathtakingly original today. Their best-known film is probably The Red Shoes, a 1948 fantasy starring Moira Shearer, as a ballerina forced to choose between a composer who really loves her and an impresario who wants to control every aspect of her life. The movie includes a sustained ballet number that was to inspire similar sequences in An American in Paris, Singing in the Rain, and other MGM musicals. Among the other restored Michael Powell films now in re-release is The Amazing Stairway to Heaven, starring David Niven as a pilot who was mistakenly sent back to Earth because of a clerical error in heaven. He and a friend, Kim Hunter, wind up pleading his case in a heavenly court. You have been called as a witness by the prosecution. You will tell the truth. This gentleman is counsel for the prosecution. The restored Powell and Pressburger films are on a tour of movie museums and revival houses, and they're available on home video now or soon will be. And now let's take another look at the movies we reviewed this week. We had a split decision on Congo, the Jungle Adventure movie. I thought it was funny. Gene didn't. We split again on The Glass Shield. It had good performances, but I felt its script was unfocused. Gene disagreed. Two thumbs up for Pocahontas, the new Disney animated feature. Gene liked it more than I did. It opens starting next week. And finally, two thumbs up for Fluke, about a man who comes back to life as a dog. And that's it for this week. Next week, we'll be back with reviews of more new movies, including Batman Forever, starring Val Kilmer as a new cape crusader, battling supervillains Jim Carrey and Tommy Lee Jones. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed.